As the name suggests, the PlayStation 5 would be Sony's next iteration of their PlayStation lineup, following on from the 2013 release of the PlayStation 4 and the refreshed PlayStation 4 Pro delivered in late 2016. Making PlayStations is sort of Sony's thing. Sony likes to release a new generation of console roughly every seven years. This gives both developers and consumers platform stability. Developers get time to fully optimize the hardware and consumers get reliability and compatibility. And it's enough time for hardware to advance, making an upgrade worthwhile. Significant technological advances have to be achieved to deliver more power to developers and drive consumer interest. And it all has to be mass produced at the same price point. Seven years appears to be the sweet spot. Be it 2020 or 2021, Sony will want to deliver in a few key areas. The second generation of PlayStation VR should have better head tracking, higher refresh rates, lower latency, and higher resolution. Next gen consoles will also need to support HDMI 2.1 and output to 8K. That's all good, but there is really only one thing any next generation console absolutely has to nail if it wants gamers to take notice, and that's 4K at 60 frames per second. 4K TVs are increasingly common and will be the affordable standard by 2020. PC users can play games at 4K60 now, so future consoles will need to step up to this new base standard. The PS4 Pro does a pretty good job of running between 1350p and 1800p, and a considerable number of Pro-enhanced titles run 1440p with dynamic scaling at 30fps. The more powerful Xbox One does a better job with more games running at a native 4K and 30fps. Neither console can manage native 4K at 60 frames per second locked in graphically demanding titles though. The PS4 Pro's GPU can push 4.2 teraflops of performance, which is slightly more than a GTX 970. The Xbox One X brings 6 teraflops, about the same as an AMD R9-390X. Consoles don't have to deal with overhead from Windows though, and their programming APIs are closer to the bare metal, a bit more like Vulkan API on a PC. This gives them somewhat better relative performance, but still not enough for true 4K60 gaming. It's certainly debatable, but my rule of thumb is you need at least 10 teraflops for 4K60 rendering. That means an RTX 2080, GTX 1080 Ti, or a Vega 64 in the few games where it's optimized enough to actually hit that. A GTX 1080 with about 8.9 teraflops can game at 4K, but you might want to tune down some settings. We know AMD is making the CPU, GPU, system on chip for the PS5, we suspect that the CPU will sport an 8-core Ryzen-like architecture, which is very plausible. So let's move from the CPU to the GPU. Without any hard specs or data so far released, we're going to have to extrapolate from what info we do have. AMD's new Navi architecture for the PS5 will be built on TSMC's 7 nanometer process, or perhaps even their N7 Plus process depending when production begins, the difference there being about 20% better transistor density and slightly lower power draw. So time for some comparisons. The CPU GPU system on chip on the PlayStation 4 Pro is 325mm squared. On the Xbox One X, it's 360mm squared. The original PS4 sits in between at 340. We have good reason to assume future consoles would also be in this range. Much smaller, and we might not pack in the performance we need. Any larger, and the chip costs too much to mass produce. Sony and Microsoft can design their chips in any way they like, of course, so we really need to take a guess here. A bigger chip means more performance, but higher production costs and more heat you have to dissipate. You can go this route, but you want to start releasing new and cheaper to produce revisions of your hardware as quickly as possible. A smaller chip means a cheaper console or higher margins and higher production volume, but your competition might have the performance advantage and that could win over customers. If you're betting on your cloud services being good enough to stream games and think that's the future, maybe you don't care as much about the processing performance of the console. That's certainly something Microsoft is actively pursuing for one of their consoles. Without knowing what the console makers are aiming for, I'll use a simple estimate of 300 to 350 millimeters squared. For our first comparison, the die size of a 14 or 12 nanometer 8 core Ryzen is about 213 millimeters squared, but a console CPU doesn't contain everything you find on a desktop CPU. So assuming 7 nanometer or 7 nanometer plus gives us a doubling of transistor density, I'm going to say we have about 70 millimeters squared for our CPU budget, and for that we get roughly Ryzen 2700 performance. That's easily enough to push 4K gaming. A 2700X paired with a 2080 Ti will reach or exceed 60 frames a second at 4K in every game you throw at it. That leaves us with about 200 to 250 millimeters squared to spend on our Navi GPU. Assuming twice the transistor density from 7 nanometers, we can do a rough comparison using GPUs in the 400 to 500 millimeters squared die size range. For that, we find 
the Vega 64 at 487, the RTX 2070 at 445, and the GTX 1080 at 314 millimeters squared. Now you might not always be at ultra settings, but those cards can definitely game at 4K at 60 frames a second. So things are looking good so far, but it's not the end of the story. The RTX 2080 at 545mm squared initially seems over our budget, but a significant portion of the RTX chip is taken up with RT and tensor cores, and it's unlikely next-gen consoles will use a Turing-like architecture. We can probably remove those 368 tensor cores from our equation and give that space over to traditional FP32 logic. And a single APU package means less duplication in certain functions between a discrete CPU and GPU. For example, the PS4 APU uses a shared memory controller, so that saves even more area. Assuming some levels of space savings from the integrated packaging and removing the RT and tensor cores, it could be possible to fit 2080-like performance into the higher end of our 250mm square area. We can look at it from another direction too. The new 7 nanometer Kirin 980 SoC for mobile devices is 74.13 mm squared and contains 6.9 billion transistors. It's already being mass produced and we can use this to infer a few other things. If the Kirin 980 can put almost 7 billion transistors into 74 mm squared, and the Apple A12 chip also on 7 nanometers can fit 6.9 billion transistors into 83 mm squared, then we have our average transistor density of about 83 to 93 million transistors per square millimeter. Horizon 2700X for comparison has about 4.94 billion transistors, and the RTX 2080 has 13.6 billion transistors, even with the tensor cores and RT cores. Obviously this sort of back of the napkin calculation is doomed to be inaccurate, but we're only trying to answer one question, can it 4K at 60? So far it's looking very good, but we're not done just yet. The CPU will have some enhancements over desktop Ryzen, and might be more like Zen 2. Some rumors suggest that Navi could be a new microarchitecture, the sequel to Graphics Core Next, but be it new or just refined, it's safe to say there will be some performance improvements and enhancements and features. Memory on consoles is also rather different. It's unified rather than having a split between DDR4 main memory and GDDR GPU memory that we have in PCs. The PS4 Pro uses GDDR5 at 217.6 gigabytes a second of bandwidth, but a move to GDDR6 could potentially double that. 448 gigabytes a second on a 256 bit bus, but over 600 gigabytes a second if that's increased to 352 bits. This leaves us to speculate about the Navi GPU. I've suggested that RTX 2070 levels of performance could be attainable, based solely on what's physically possible. We also have leaks indicating this is the case. Given what we know about Navi and Zen 2, and considering the timeframes involved, there's every reason to expect the next generation consoles, and that includes the PlayStation 5 and the Scorpio, will easily be able to play games at 4K60. In fact, I'm also willing to bet that the next generation consoles will be able to play some titles at 120Hz. So in summary, we've got 4K60, some titles at 120Hz, 8K output for video, but there probably will not be any Turing-like fixed function hardware for ray tracing. But you don't actually need that for ray tracing, but that's a topic for a different video. And right now I'll give solid state storage a 50-50 chance. The data sets used by games are becoming increasingly massive, anywhere from 50 to 100 gigabytes. Solid state storage is almost becoming a necessity for low boot times. Prices are already around $100 for 500 gigabytes, and they keep dropping. An SSD might not be as sexy as an 8-core CPU with RTX 2070 level performance running 4K games at 60 frames a second, but it's still a big boost to the user experience overall.